All right. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, and thank you all for attending tonight's panel discussion entitled Helping Our Youth Manage Back to School Anxiety. Uh, my name is Tony Poliafico. I'm a clinical psychologist specializing in anxiety disorders in kids and adolescents. Uh, and I direct the Columbia University Clinic for Anxiety and Related Disorders, Westchester uh, in Tarrytown, New York. I'll be moderating our discussion tonight, and I'm thrilled to be joined by three terrific panelists who will provide mental health, school-based, and parent perspectives on how to help our children effectively manage anxiety about returning to school this academic year, which I know is on the forefront of many of our minds. So allow me to introduce our panel. First, we have Emery Albano, who is a clinical psychologist, founder of the Columbia University Clinic for Anxiety and Related Disorders, and clinical director of New York Presbyterian's Youth Anxiety Center. We have Jane Dembski, who is the founder of the School Avoidance Alliance and is a school avoidance advocate for countless parents, caregivers, and families. Uh, and we have Elizabeth Stranzold, who is the director of policy for the New York City Department of Education's Division, Division of Climate and Wellness. So we have a very impressive panel, really kind of crossing disciplines and able to speak to mental health, school-based family concerns. And I'm really looking forward to, uh, you know, really hearing everybody's perspectives on many of the questions we're all thinking about and facing as we get ready for the school year. And as we continue to live through this COVID-19 pandemic, um, which has really disrupted our children's lives immeasurably and has forced them out of their normal school routines, away from their social connections for really the last 20 months or so. Um, and one thing that we know about anxiety is that anxiety grows when we avoid it and when we're not challenging ourselves or engaging with the world. You know, add into that the mix that many of our children and teens have suffered family losses financial hardships due to COVID, and many have reckoned with racial injustices over the last year. Um, so it's, it's really no surprise that we've seen a rise in anxiety in kids and teens. But you know, one of our other basic understandings about anxiety is that we can effectively manage it by approaching instead of avoiding and receiving support along the way. So our children getting back to school this year and getting back into a normal routine um, is a really important step in that direction. And our aim for tonight is really to share experiences and helpful strategies to give all of our perspectives in different areas and, and disciplines, um, and really to provide approaches and resources to all of you to support your children and support your families as we all prepare for this academic year. Uh, a couple basic housekeeping tips. Um, we plan to review some main areas um, during the majority of the talk. And we're planning to leave about 10 to 15 minutes for attendee questions. Um, please feel free to include questions in the Q&A section, um, which you should see on your screen. And we will review them and then I will share them with the panel. Um, I can't promise we'll get to every question, but we'll try to do our best. Um, if you can, if you can provide information about um, you know, ages or kind of uh, demographics so we can be as helpful as we can in terms of providing, uh, providing answers. Um, other than that, this video is being recorded, so please be mindful of questions that you do ask, and you will be able to access it um, after, after today. I will be sharing some resources at the end of today that are also available on our Cope Columbia website, which will supplement you know, a lot of the information we're talking about today. Um, so thank you all again for being here. Thank you in advance to our terrific panel for giving your time and your experience today. And I'm going to jump right into our questions. And really our format today is to throw out questions um, that are really facing all of us as professionals and as parents and caregivers um, with the idea to give you all, like I said, experience and, and strategies and approaches for, for getting ready uh, for this school year. So I'll start with, what have been um, all of your experiences with student anxiety over the past two academic years? Um, what have you seen um, from the mental health front, from the school front, you know, from the caregiver and family front? And Marie, I'll, I'll ask you to start with this question. What have been your experiences in terms of working with children and families um, and dealing with school-based anxiety? 
Well, thank you for having me. And I have to say, I'm very excited to be on this panel with Elizabeth and Jane. And Elizabeth and I are just getting to know one another, but Jane, I've been following her website on school avoidance for years, and it's been an incredible resource for the communities out there. Um, you know, it's been, as we know, it's a unique last couple of years for school avoidance. Just for some perspective, I've been working in this arena since the early 90s. And with Chris Carney from uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, we've published even manuals and ways for parents to work with clinicians on uh, reversing school refusal behavior, which is where kids are motivated to avoid school because they're more anxious or more depressed while they're in school. Mm -hmm. And so there's a number of ways that we work with it um, through a cognitive behavioral approach and then also with medication as needed. What's been interesting about the last uh, year and a half, almost two years now with COVID, of course, is for some kids, being at home and being on Zoom has been a dream come true. It's what they wanted. This is where we typically see, we've been seeing the kids who have social anxiety, a lot of worry about what people think of them, having to be in around peers who they feel judged by, um, or being called on in ways that really put them in performance and evaluative situations, taking tests in the classroom, different things like that. Those kids feel more relief at home. At the same time, there are those who turn the camera off or they're always having issues, you know, in a sense, um, because they don't even like it on Zoom. Um, and so there's a lot of anxiety that we're seeing that is coming to the forefront, even though the kids are not in school. All right. It relates, though, a lot to social anxiety. And then we're also seeing a lot of worry. How do you prepare to have everything in front of you at your fingertips to do a classroom that is virtual? I mean, we used to have worry about the kids who we'd send to school who had generalized anxiety and they carried everything, including the kitchen sink and the pets in their backpack because they were afraid they needed something and they might leave it at home. Now it's like parents are talking to us about the way the kids are falling apart because they might not have exactly what they need right at their fingertips. So there's so many ways we're seeing it manifest, um, but mainly it's driving a lot of anxiety that kids used to be able to accommodate in some ways, getting the class just on time, not having to go to extracurriculars, various things. And now, you know, some of them are able to hide more and others are feeling more exposed through Zoom. I'll yeah, um, you guys, Jane. <laughs> I, I agree. I've heard the same things, but it's very interesting that um, I have a Facebook group and the parents are really worried about their kids getting back to school. And obviously because I'm in school avoidance, there are a number of them with school avoidant kids who are really panicked. And um, when they were online, it was even harder to control because you really don't have the input of the school, the physicality of the teachers being able to help because the teachers and the um, staff in the building, they are really the ones to help the kids. And this is really, what they say to parents, these are your best friends right now, that you should be reaching out to them. They have the ability to help you and help your kids. They can maybe modify their entry into school. They might be able to have teachers connect with the kids. They might be able to modify some workloads and homework. I mean, I don't know, like it's, everyone's wondering what's gonna happen? Are they gonna slam them with tons of academics or again? You know, when they come back, everyone's scared of all of this um, education loss. But, you know, it really depends, I think. It all depends on the culture and the leaders of the school district in terms of how they go. Mm -hmm. Some Very are really good. progressive and they get it and they want to help and others. And they also have the um, pressure from parents who want their kids to, you know, excel and be able to get in the best colleges. So it's all over the place. But um the good thing about anxiety is we know that is treatable and I'll let you guys get into all that CBT stuff. I, I love cognitive behavioral therapy. So maybe you guys can get into that. Oh, thank you, Jane and Anne-Marie. And, and what I'm hearing is that there's really a range of anxiety concerns that our kids have been dealing with over these last two years. Some of them are very COVID related, fear of illness. We've had kids who are afraid of um, following the rules or other kids not following the rules and like that social anxiety of how do I deal with it if other kids aren't being safe around me. So there's all these like 
kind of indirect connections in terms of the fears and worries that our kids face. Unfortunately, we have kids and teens who have been dealing with loss and trauma related to uh, related to death or related to family situations. Um, but what I'm also hearing is that there's a lot of anxiety, and I've seen it directly, that isn't uh, formally connected to COVID, but has to do with, you know, not being in that academic setting, not being around peers, not being in that rhythm, um, which I think is normal for a lot of our kids to be experiencing. So I, one thing that I want to emphasize is if your kids are experiencing some anxiety right now, I think that's normal. I think it would be a little odd if a kid isn't feeling a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit nervous about this upcoming school year. Um, but, you know, we want to be really addressing and identifying if that anxiety is is more problematic. I guess my next question um, is thinking really directly to the schools and, and Elizabeth, maybe you can get us started, um, but I'm sure it would help attendees to learn more about how schools and, and uh, both city schools and, and outside are responding to these concerns, responding to the anxiety that we're seeing. Um, how, have you, how have you and your colleagues responded to these concerns? How do you plan to approach them this academic year? Yeah, thank you for that. And I'm so grateful to be here representing our division and Deputy Chancellor Robinson. Um, my work is at the central level. So we do like systems level work for the DOE. And so I just want to acknowledge, I'm going to share some of what we did system wide. I know that in addition to that, there are amazing teachers out there who are making it happen for their kids every single day. And um, I'm sure they have even more creative strategies than what I can offer. But at, at a systems level, we really did three key things to prepare our staff last year that we're strengthening as we go into the upcoming school year. So the first was expanding some of our foundational social emotional learning supports that we had invested in pre-COVID. So in partnership with New York City's First Lady, Shirlene McRae and the Thrive team, as well as DOE staff, we had spent several years building up a menu of social emotional learning programs and ensuring access citywide. So programs like Harmony, Ruler, Restorative Practices, Advisory. And when COVID hit, we were really able to leverage a lot of that investment to create a structured space in schools where young people could bring that anxiety and those questions and have someone that, that cares, someone that is listening, someone that is asking them about it. And, and someone who understands that the anxieties that they bring are not only COVID related, it's also like the Asian American community and significant anxiety around hate crimes, black community as well, like really structurally creating a space that honors their experiences. And we were able to do that through a lot of our programming. So if you think about some of the social emotional skills that are embedded in there, like self-awareness, oh, I'm anxious. This is how I feel coming into the school. Self-management, here are the coping skills I can use. Advocacy, here's who I can ask for help. So the, we were able, obviously we had to pivot and be more thoughtful in what it looked like to implement those types of programs virtually, what the context of our questions were, but leveraging that foundational support to ensure that all schools had systems for that and, and routines for that was really important. So that, that was our first thing. The second key thing that we did was focus on capacity building for adults. And we did extensive work with University of Chicago and their trauma responsive educational practices program to build a professional learning series for not only school principals, but all school staff members and even community members who are working with our schools. So to date, we've had over 80,000 individuals complete this series that is designed to help uh, take some of the anxiety of educators down by empowering them with information because educators are anxious too. Like, oh my gosh, I wanna be able to meet the needs of the young people. Like, what do I say? What do I do? I don't wanna do the wrong thing. I don't wanna overlook something. So offering a professional learning series and empowering them with information really helped them feel to, to feel prepared um, of how might this look in young people? How can I respond supportively? What should I look for that maybe I didn't look for before? And then the third thing was just building our um, bank of resources. So we created a resource guide called the Bridge to School Plan, which had very practical, literally day one of school, day two, week one, week two, ready to go materials for educators that focused on building community, fostering resilience, 
these were activities that you didn't need to be a trained clinician. We wanted to destigmatize this notion that I have to be a therapist to be able to support young people. No, you don't. There is a role for therapists and they have specialized knowledge, but everyone who cares about kids and who values relationships can be supportive. So making those resources available kind of as a complement to our professional learning was, was what we wanted to do system-wide to set people up for success. And I think as we look ahead, it's really just going deeper with those investments. So we're creating a bridge to school 2.0, like freshening up some of the resources, new activities. Um, we extended our professional learning platform for another year. So it's free of charge for not only staff members, but like community organizations that partner with schools who kind of want to be on the same page, have access to the course. Um, we recently completed what we're calling our Family and Community Wellness Collective, where we actually trained over 800 parents and parent leaders in trauma-informed care. And this is like so exciting. I talk about it every chance I get. I had to talk about it here too. Um, but really empowering them to do the work also because they know their kids and they care about their kids. They care about the community and just being in community with them. Like they had so many ideas. I was like, I need to do this with a five-year-old. This is awesome. So really tapping into the resources in your community and just building a collective of adults who really care. Um, we're hiring 500 social workers. We're doing a lot of different things really deep in the work, yeah. And um, and I think the last new thing, and then I'll, I'll share the, the mic on this, is we're implementing social emotional learning screening tools. So being able to really identify at a point in time, non-diagnostic, not clinical, it's a competency-based, strengths-based assessment that helps us understand what are the needs that young people have who are coming in, how can we identify someone who might need additional support, but how can we also strengthen that foundational work that we're doing every single day with all young people who we know will have needs, regardless of how they might have uniquely experienced the past school year. So a lot of work that we were able to build on, a lot that we did in year one, and, and we're just getting started. You know, this, this is like a hot moment for social emotional learning and mental health right now, but we know this has been the work to do for years and years, and are just really looking forward to continuing it. Oh, it's fantastic. It's so wonderful wow. to hear all of this. And uh, I appreciate you summarizing all of this for, for folks, Elizabeth. Um, it's comforting, I guess is the word, but more than comforting. It's like so important and needed that, you know, all of this is work is happening and it's, and it's mobilizing. I guess just one thought that comes to mind is for caregivers who may, uh, whose students may be in the New York City schools, if they are concerned or they're looking to receive more support. What do you recommend as a first step for, for a caregiver in that situation? Yeah, that's a great question and we get that a lot. I would say your first step is your child's teacher. Um, if you have a relationship with or knowledge of who the counselor or the social worker is, you can certainly start there too. But the reason we recommend starting with the teacher is because even if your child does have more specialized needs that that will involve them being in, let's say, some type of counseling support, that child is still in the teacher's classroom every single day. So you, without sharing too many personal details, you would want the teacher to be aware of generally what some of your concerns are and how they can be supportive because they absolutely can be supportive. So I would start there. Um, if, if you're not comfortable with that, you know, seek out a counselor or social worker. If you don't know who those people are, you could always ask your school principal. A lot of this stuff is often posted on a school website or um, communicated through like family newsletters or other channels. Um, so I would tap into those and, and start there. And then, you know, sometimes like schools do have mental health resources, but they're not providing the intensive clinical services that you could access, let's say from a community organization. So I would say starting with the school and then if they're not able to meet all of your needs, asking for referrals for where else can I go? You know, our schools have relationships with community organizations. We do the work in partnership with them and they'll be able to help you not only discern what sort of support is needed, but, but how to access it. That's terrific. Thank you so much. Um, I can speak to, 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 you know, hearing all that, I can also speak to as someone who works primarily in Westchester, Westchester County. Um, many of these initiatives or similar initiatives are happening in many of the Westchester public and, and private schools. And I've been so impressed with working with districts that have really um, focused heavily on socio-emotional learning and have really, uh, you know, beefed up their, uh, both their training, but also resources um, and are always willing and eager to partner with me as a professional and with caregivers and families. So hearing all of this, it just reminds me 
I know sometimes there could be a bit of trepidation to reach out to school or to share with school if, if a child's struggling, whether it's normal anxiety or, or something that's more problematic. Um, I, I, in, in almost every case, I think it's a really helpful and important step to partner and work together because there are so many resources at the school level that oftentimes we don't even know about. Well, an important thing to, is that if you're dealing with anxiety about school or youth who has difficulties going and staying in school, even staying in their classroom through the course of the day, you have to work with the school on this. Um, it, it really is something, and Jane, I mean, I'd be interested yeah. as we talk, you know, uh, you can't do it on your own because you're only working from really one angle in a flat screen. You've got to get with the teacher, or with the school counselor, or someone to understand what's going on on the inside and then come together. We oftentimes, Tony knows this, we work sometimes with families who come to us after their child has been out of school for months uh, with school refusal behavior. And by this point, the school and the parents are sort of at each other. And it's like, wait, wait, our first job is to say, let's sit down and understand we, we all want the same thing. You want that child to be in school comfortably and love learning. And so let's get there. The sooner you work with the school, the better is the way that it goes. Well, Anne-Marie, I'm really glad you mentioned that because after focusing on school avoidance for so many years and helping families, I realized a very simple thing that I don't know why I didn't realize it earlier, but we really need to educate the educators about school avoidance and best practices and first line treatments because it's not their fault. They don't know about school avoidance. A lot of people treat it as truancy. They might not have the same resources as some in other schools and they need the education. So in my website now, I, I offer help for parents and educators because we really need to work together. Right. And um, I also really suggest, as you said, work with the school district. And if the kids are in middle school or high school, you can reach out to the intervention team. They're also known as the response to intervention team or the child study team. And it's also known as student support team. They are the mental health professionals within the special education department. And parents like me, I didn't know this, that an emotional disorder is an emotional disability and it is treated just like a physical disability, intellectual, developmental disability in the eyes of the school. So kids with an emotional disability should have access to the same services as other kids. Sometimes schools misinterpret the law. Again, it's no fault of theirs. There is so much information about the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and Section 504. I don't wanna get into all that minutia, but it is confusing. So it really is the parents, unfortunately, it does land on our shoulders. You know, We are their advocate. It's really important for parents to look up the spe their special education rights for their state. Each state has their own pamphlet. It's called the Parent's Guide to Special Ed or Procedural Safeguards. And this will tell you who to contact in your school for what, your rights, how many days it will take until they get back to you and everything that is important to know and document. You need to document everything, make yeah. phone calls, but write everything in an email and again, when the school doors open in September, we have no idea what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So if any parents are really worried now, I say now is the time, get in, send a letter. They might not respond right away, so call them. Mm -hmm. They're not ignoring you, they're just, their inbox is huge. Oh, I think that's great advice to be on, on top of these issues early if you're identifying them. Uh, I'm gonna move on to uh, a related topic, but again, in the nuts and bolts of what are very usable approaches that caregivers can take on. And really thinking about for all returning students, you know, whether they're highly anxious or not, but in preparing them for, for this beginning of the school year, what are strategies that caregivers can take to support students just in managing the stress of getting back to school? Emery, do you wanna get us started here? Well, now is the time and actually, for anyone who's on listening to us from Florida, yesterday was the time because <laughs> school started yesterday for my, oh my niece gosh. and nephew there. Um, in other words, it's, you know, now is the time really, it can't be too soon that first and foremost, you get your kids back on a good sleep schedule. 
Um, so think first about what do, what do your kids need to, to move back into the routine of getting up in the morning, getting ready, getting out the door, um, sleeping at night uh, and such. So start thinking about that. Get them hydrated well, get them eating again, make sure they're getting exercise and good sleep. Another thing too is think about your kids, those who have been anxious in the past, those who have had school refusal um, issues in the past, those who you've seen over the course of this time of COVID who have lost touch with friends um, or no longer on the activities or maybe they weren't in activities to start with and now they really have been just on their own. We've got to figure out a way, as Elizabeth says, as Jane says, reach out to the teacher first and foremost to see, hey, can I bring my kid in to meet you? Can you get in there in the, you know, right before school is opening, get the kids a little more comfortable with the lay of the land. So do a little bit of exposing them to what's expected. And especially, you know, talking to the teacher and getting to know the teacher is one of the best steps because that teacher is gonna be the entree, not that they can pay attention to every child at every moment, but they'll know, okay, you know, let me make sure this kid is, you know, connecting with others or, or so forth. So those are some of the things I would say, you know, their routine, their habits and health, and, and then get them excited, help let them start picking out their books, their clothes, you name it. And who are they going to go to school with? Figure that out. Mm -hmm. No, those are great tips. And yes, some of them feel basic, but in this year, in these last more than a year, you know, it's been important to stick with the basics and that's gotten us through a lot. Uh, Jane or Elizabeth, other other ideas for caregivers to help with that back to school stress. I was going to add just something around like uh, being thoughtful around the communication that you engage in and not overselling um, what you know, but not ignoring it either. So like my own five-year-old is uh, like someone put in the Q and A, a five-year-old too, who's like, mom, I, what about this? And 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 I can't give her a roadmap of this is every single thing that's going to happen. So I need to be honest about that and say, here's what I do know. Here's how I can support you through it. And if stuff comes up that you're not ready for, like we can talk about it. We could talk to the teacher so that she's not feeling like her success in school is contingent on having every single answer. We need to be really clear that we're not going to have every single answer, but pointing to opportunities of resilience that were developed last year. Like remember last year, we didn't have all the information and here's an example of how you were really successful with that. Here's an example of how you had support and then using that to preview like systems that they can tap into because sometimes as parents, our instinct can be to just like, oh no, it'll be fine. You're gonna love it. And that's, that's really dismissive. And yeah. then on the other hand, you know, I wanna tell her everything, but I can't. So really just balancing how much information you share so that you're managing expectations um, and, and, and kind of previewing the support structures so that if something doesn't go as planned, she's not, you know, panicking, but she knows like, okay, I can talk to this person, I can do this, I can do that. I think it's such an important point of what we're modeling as caregivers um, and to be mindful of what you're saying and how you're saying it. And I would just add to that, be mindful of what you're doing and what's around in the home, you know, what news is available to your children, um, that it's, you know, it's appropriate for children to have a uh, understanding at their developmental level of what's going on in the world or what's going on with COVID. But, you know, a five-year-old or a younger child may not need to hear everything that might be on the radio or on the, on the cable news network. Um, also, how are we modeling in how we take in information in conversations we have on the phone or with our partners or with other people about the start of the school year? You know, if, if our kids here are saying, oh, my goodness, it's going to be, uh, you know, we're all going to be sick by November or, you know, they, if they hear our anxiety, they're going to feel anxious. And so, you know, modeling that appropriate concern and using safety guidelines, but also trusting that, you know, the people in our systems are, are doing everything that, that they can to keep our students safe and that we trust going back into the school year um, and back into school. I would say the other piece that, the other usable strategy I keep in mind is really balancing empathy with expectation. So, you know, hearing our kids when they say I'm scared or I'm worried and, you know, sitting with them and saying, I understand and I get it and validating that concern and also saying, you know, I understand this is hard and I'm confident that you can do it. 
So putting both of those pieces together, because for many of us, we might fall more on the side of we're really good validators and it's a little harder to push. Mm -hmm. And some of us, um, and I'm guilty of this as well, sometimes, you know, focus more on the, like the expectation and the empathy, but I think working to notice and be aware of both when dealing with anxiety um, is, is really important. And if I, you know, can emphasize too, what Elizabeth, you've brought up and Tony, you just talked about, Jane knows this, check your own anxiety. Um, Tony and I have a colleague, John Comer, who's down in Florida now, and I have to bring up John, and his dissertation way back when really demonstrated how, how parents receive news of at, at the time he was doing his dissertation, it was about 9-11 and it was about you know terrorism and such, how parents receive news and they themselves deal with that can get transmitted. The anxiety and upset they have can get transmitted to the kids. And so the kids become more anxious. And others have shown, even in work in my clinic, in our labs and stuff have shown that if you're worried about your child's anxiety, about your child's reaction, about how your child's gonna handle things, about it, if you show anxiety, it's gonna be communicated to your child. So for you too, as parents, think about what's realistic here, what actually might happen, what problem solving can we put in place? And I think Elizabeth, you just gave a beautiful you know, presentation of being matter of fact, giving enough information, saying we can't cover everything, but you know, we'll deal with, with it as it comes along. And it's so important rather than anticipating more and more and more problem. Yeah. Absolutely. That leads me to um, space treatment from Dr. Eli Leibowitz out of Yale. It's very similar to what you said, Anthony, about validating their fears and anxieties, but then supporting them and giving them the confidence that they can overcome it. And um, space treatment, I think, is uh, stands for supporting parenting anxious child no childhood emotions. Mm -hmm. But basically, it talks about it not letting the parent enable the child, which I am so guilty of that. Mm -hmm. I did it, and not giving into the accommodation. So, like, if a child is OCD and you're driving, and the, your child says, "I need to go back to the house and see if the lights are on," don't do it. Um, that's part of the rationale behind it. And because it teaches the child how to feel the anxiety and how to deal with it and learn how to problem solve. So I love space treatment. And um, it's, uh, I think I included it in the notes. I have it on my website. But um, in addition to Mr. Comer, I also <laughs> like um, space treatment from Dr. Leibowitz. And so many of these ideas apply um, yes, for kids who may be highly anxious, but also for all of our students and teens, for caregivers to keep in mind, it's, I think those big pillars are really kind of balancing that empathy with expectation, uh, modeling in ourselves that calm yet appropriate approach and uh, partnering with school. And I think the one thing that's been touched on, I just want to emphasize as a real usable strategy is getting familiar with aspects of the school year now before it starts. If Amory mentioned uh, students who haven't been around their peers recently, I would set up for our younger kids play dates or, you know, maybe even play dates at the playground or on the school, you know, near the school, connecting with some kids who they're going to see in the building this way. There's familiar faces and kids who they've seen recently. For our older, or for our older students, I would still encourage, you know, getting together, having a hangout, go get ice cream, you know, taking those steps to make it easier for our kids to connect. So there's less unfamiliar, unfamiliarity on that first day. Uh, you know, and again, if there are questions or not quite sure how to handle this, I think that, that one of the key points is that uh, particularly in the coming weeks, school folks will, will be starting to kind of be back in schools and can, you know, can be available. So, you know, thinking along these lines, um, we touched on this earlier, but, you know, we're all carrying some anxiety or some stress through, through these years and uh, through these COVID years. And I'm wondering um, how can parents effectively manage perhaps their own anxiety about kids returns to school? How can they kind of hold that? What are strategies that parents and caregivers can use to manage their own anxiety as they promote all these great strategies we were just talking about? Um, 
Jane, I know this is, you know, something you have a lot of experience with in the, in the professional work that you do. So I'll uh, ask you to get us started. I think I might have said it all and I forgot, you know, I'm getting old, so I might have said it already, but I really believe in cognitive behavioral therapy for the parents um, because that focuses on all our automatic thoughts, our automatic negative thoughts. And when you're worried about your child, you know, your mind goes haywire, all those worries, what's going to happen, they're not going to graduate, they can't go to college, they're going to live in the basement for the rest mm -hmm. of my life. So I really believe in cognitive behavioral therapy, it really helps you reframe your thoughts and see them. And Dr. Albano also has a great book on CBT for parents. I think it's called You and Your Anxious Child. And um, I really believe in CBT. I've seen it work with many people. I think it's so awesome that the school district should have it as a required course <laughs> because it is basic life skills in order to see the world and react to the world in a different, better, more controlled way. And um, so that's really my advice. And as I mentioned, working on the solution by calling the school, you know, taking action. I also want to give a plug to Dr. Lori Santos at Yale for the Science of Wellbeing course. Yes. You guys might have all heard about it. It's free on Coursera. But I can't tell you how awesome this course is. I loved it. I took it when COVID hit. I started to get really depressed. And listening to her class and all the ways um, to promote well-being and happiness. The, geez, it's true. It really worked, and it's a free resource. So I, you know, you have to be strong for your kids and mentally strong. And you know, part of the self-care is taking care of your mind and body and soul. So I just wanted to give a plug to uh, the sides of well-being from Dr. Lori Santos as well. Yeah, I can underscore everything you said. One of the things we've been doing in the past year is also doing workshops for parents. And I've got to say for teachers, because that's the other, you know, the, the educators who are there with kids all day, let's remember, they have their own families and kids too. Um, there's a lot going on and everyone is worried about the masks issues, the vaccine issues, the variant issues, all of these things. Number one thing is for everyone, parents and kids, again, get good sleep. You as a parent cannot give up taking care of yourself because you're, you know, you're worried about your kids. You have to first and foremost, make sure that you are nurtured, that you are sleeping enough, that you are getting good nutrition and all, and where you can sharing the load. If you're a single parent who, friend or other relative who can help you out, if you're partnered, okay, one of you works a lot, the other works a lot, whatever. You've got to figure out ways to come together and share the load so that you have time to yourself. If you don't do that for yourself, your nerves are frayed. And then you have a kid who's anxious about everything going on. It's just going to make you not be able to stay calm and be sort of the rational responder for your kid who can see, okay, whatever this issue is, we can deal with it. Um, a lot of questions are coming up about how, you know, the worries kids are going to have about what if other kids aren't masked or they don't follow the rules and such. And one of the things we, we always need to be aware of, we can only do what we can do. We can't affect, you know, make other people change their behavior. Um, so if you are, if your child's telling you they are uncomfortable, let's say in school, uh, cause the kids aren't masked or what you've got to work with them a little about how to assert themselves. So they let the teacher know, I mean, teenagers should be able to talk to whoever's in charge of that classroom or whatever, or even to the peers themselves and say, look, I get it. You know, you might not be a masked person for whatever reason, but I am. And so we're not going to hang together or I'm going to sit on the other side of the room. We've got to help our kids be assertive and set limits. If you can do that and, mo and model that for your kids, then they're going to come along. So take care of yourself first and foremost, and then again, model for them and help them, you know, to develop and, and see the way that you manage difficult situations related to your own issues with work and, and COVID and all the things you juggle. Thanks so much, Emery. Um, I'm also reminded of a phrase I've been hearing and saying a lot these last uh, 20 months or so, which is good enough parenting. You know, <laughs> noticing that we're not, none of us are going to be able to kind of be perfect at the parenting job we're doing. Being okay with 
uh, you know, being good enough right now and managing that and kind of practicing that, that self-kindness, because then it models that to your kids, that it's okay not to be perfect. It's okay to be struggling sometimes with something or coping through something. And I think that could be really, really helpful for all of our kids, you know, our highly anxious kids, but all of them to see their caregivers, not as perfect people who don't have anxiety and who master through the world, but people who, you know, deal with stress and sometimes, you know, often learn how to kind of manage it and sometimes struggle with it a bit. And so I think that, you know, being kind and actually, you know, in appropriate ways, modeling that to, to our kids is real, is real important. Um, I think the other, just a very practical thing I would recommend, and I've been promoting and trying to kind of follow myself is, you know, following our local and national and school guidelines, using them as an anchor. Uh, they're changing. We know they're changing. We know it's a moving target. And we know that sometimes they're behind where, you know, reality might be. So using them as an anchor and the information we're getting from, from school and from, you know, other folks. And then if it feels like, you know, we need to go above and beyond in terms of safety, talking with loved ones or talking with people in your community who you trust to make sure that, you know, what the guidelines that we're putting in place are important to be safe, but aren't necessarily taking it to a level of just like because of anxiety. Because, you know, yeah. those like a lot of those extra measures can then incur and model that anxiety for our kids and can make it scarier to kind of get back to school. Yeah. And, I, you know, one of the things to think about, too, is now is the time I'm just thinking about, you know, what we've talked about to this point. Now is the time you know your children well. Are you seeing things that indicate they are developing more anxiety in advance of going back in? Because um, there are signs that you can look for. Are they not talking about school? Are they not wanting to, you know, buy their, their notebooks or look at clothes that they're going to wear? Are they not wanting to talk to friends who are in school with them? Think about these kinds of things. We know parents, we always get parent input of how kids are doing because what you observe is very much important for us to hear because kids don't often tell you what they're feeling inside, but you can notice what they're doing. So take a look at what your kids are doing for signs of their avoiding the idea of preparing to go back in. And then that's where you start opening a conversation. Mm, you know, we've put off going to get some school clothes for, for a while now, what's going on? Let's talk about that. And, and, you know, so that's one of the first things. And then again, you know, the big thing too um, for kids is if they can feel that they can express themselves without you judging them or without them hearing, oh, it'll be fine. Oh, you know, just, you know, knocking away their worries. You've got to really let those worries come out and say, you know, I'm hearing what you're saying. I can understand how you can feel very anxious about that. Let's talk about what we could do that makes sense. And for some kids, we've been recommending putting little uh, go bags together that have their hand sanitizer, some wipes, an extra mask, you know, in, in a baggie that's in their, their backpack, extra mask for the kids who forgot them and say, I don't have one. Oh my gosh. Okay. I got one for you. You know, not that we want anyone to get obsessive about it, but just so your kid feels, you know, comfortable. If they're riding subways or on a school bus, and sometimes there are gooey things just before COVID, you might want to have now a little wipe. It's okay. It's normal to feel that way and normal to react and take care of it. Thanks, Anne-Marie. So one last uh, item, I figure it's, it's topical, but just dealing with increased COVID rates and the Delta variant that we're all living through right now. Um, it certainly throws, you know, a kink in our school plans and, you know, the, our comfort levels for sure in terms of our kids returning back to school. Um, I can get us started with just some, you know, some strategies that I've been keeping in mind. You know, one which we've touched on is to continue to keep that calm and informed approach. So modeling, you know, being informed, but also being calm um, and really also reviewing with kids why the benefits of going to school outweigh the risks. You know, yeah. we can't say there are zero risks. There are very few things in life that have zero risks. But, you know, I'll maintain that even with Delta, the benefits of our kids getting back to school with safety guidelines and many of our older kids vaccinated, particularly seeing what we saw last school year and the relatively lower transmission rates at school, the benefits of kids being in school outweigh the risks. And the risks of them not being in school 
you know, outweigh those benefits. And so reviewing with kids the things that are meaningful for them about being at school, whether it's playing a sport or being around their friends or all these reasons why it's so important for them to be there. And that's why we, we see it as worth it, yeah. uh, you know, and, and still do even with Delta. So those are the two biggies that come to mind for me. I would say along the lines of managing your own um, anxiety and staying calm, try to anticipate what's going to stress you out and then think about how you can prepare to deal with that outside of your children. So like for me, one of the most stressful things going into the school year is the scheduling and the childcare and not knowing like, is the school going to go remote a month in? And then I'm going to have to change my whole after school plan and who's going to take her there and who's going to pick her up. For me, that's, that's one of the biggest points of anxiety. So I already know like, I shouldn't have those conversations near my child. When she, when I find that out and I talk to her about it, I'm not presenting as stressed out. Like I have, you know, my, my plan B if we go remote a month in. So try to think of like, where might you be triggered as an adult and how you can proactively support, build a support plan so that if, should that come up, you can do what Tony is saying and, you know, maintain the calm and focus on being a supportive adult. And you know, that is fantastic that you say that. One of the big things that kids respond uh, with anxiety to is not knowing what's gonna happen or change in plans and routines. Yeah. And so one of the things there is uh, to practice the, you know, dealing with the unknown. And so with some families, what we've been doing is um, that, okay, we're gonna leave the, the week open. You're not gonna know. <laughs> where we're going, what activities we're doing, what we're having. We're just going to wing it through the week. Now that's hard for many kids. That is hard, but it, it sort of um, mimics some of the things that happen in school sometimes, you know, when schedules have to change, some of the teacher called in sick and you get a substitute, what may have may happen. That's okay. So if you can practice some of those things, that'll be helpful to the kids. Wonderful. Thank you all. Um, I'm going to share my screen again. Um, to just share some resources with us all before we open up for more questions and answers. Because, um, you know, we, we wanted today to be conversational, to bring up strategies, but also to uh, make it a little more interesting and engaging. And at the same time, you know, we have a lot of this information in written form and available to folks um, online. So I'm going to share this and I'm also going to be putting in the chat a little later today some of these links. So. Um, let me just move us through there. Speaking of good enough presenting, I mm -hmm. forgot to uh, show our panelist link, but here's <laughs> our wonderful panel. Um, here is our link, and I'll put it up in you know uh, in the chat section in a moment. But the Colt Columbia webpage has a lot of resources, and we recently added a page specifically for back to school resources for kids. So a lot of these uh, resources I'm about to show are already there. Um, I will put this hyperlink there so you don't need to worry about writing it down. I'll put it in the chat section, but this can, you know, hopefully this is a resource for folks, not, you know, for all students returning to school, for all caregivers preparing to return to school. Um, then we have videos available. Anne-Marie, even pre-COVID, was speaking about how to raise kids who can overcome anxiety. Um, through New York Presbyterian, we also created a webinar series on pandemic parenting, and much of that is still relevant today. So I would Look, I, I would check all those resources out as well. Um, the Morgan Stanley Alliance for Children's Mental Health, which, which we partner with, has also created tip sheets, both in English and in Spanish, to be ready for supporting our kids' mental health this fall, and our teens in particular. Um, and here are websites just as, as resources and information. Um, I'll often use the CDC website just to make sure that what I'm promoting in terms of like managing anxiety is in line with what's you know, what's being said more nationally. Uh, Jane has done a terrific job with the School Avoidance Alliance and has a wonderful page about working with your school and partnering with your school. And I know, you know, prior to, just prior to our talk, you know, we we're talking about getting information online and through social media, through, uh, through the New York City schools and through Elizabeth's division. So we'll have information there from, in terms of school supports. Worry Wise Kids is a wonderful site for child anxiety. And if you are concerned about your child maybe needing professional help for anxiety, you're speaking with a, a clinician, Effective Child Therapy is a wonderful resource and directory for, uh, for clinicians. Um, and then finally, here are just two recent blog posts with some of these tips laid out. 
Um, John, John Piacentini, who's a colleague and a wonderful child anxiety expert at UCLA, um, and then Columbia's own Allison Winnick, who also spoke to returning to school. So again, I will be posting all of these momentarily, um, and we'll, and all of this will be available by a recording. And Simon will be uh, adding this recording link or, or where to access this through the chat as well. But let's use our remaining minutes and really speak speak to the Q and A. And I think what I'm noticing from the questions and answers are just questions about specifically kind of how to manage that concern about feeling safe. Um, you know, thank you to the question about uh, the five-year-old beginning kindergarten, feeling safe around strangers. And I think it really speaks to this concern about how do we help our kids who haven't been in situations for so long, or to, to, to put it another way, how do we help our kids who might've missed developmental milestones because of COVID? and are anxious because they haven't been in those situations. So I think it speaks to that. And there's a few other questions that are related there. So I'll open that up to the, to the group here. How do you help kids who may have missed experiences and having to play catch up and may have anxiety about that catch up that they have to play? This is one of the central things that we work, Tony knows this, um, that we work with at the, our clinics here at Columbia is we address anxiety and the related issues that kids have, ADHD, whatever it might be. But at the same time, we're really taking assessment of normatively, what should a kid at this age be doing? I mean, an example I always use are the teenagers who do not wake up to an alarm clock, mom or dad have to come in and shake them 10 different times to get them out of bed. Well, you know, really by fifth grade, you could be waking up to an alarm clock. <laughs> what are things they don't do for themselves that have nothing to do with anxiety or whatever necessarily? These are milestones of development, of being more and more independent in terms of your um, behavior, independence in terms of you know, managing your emotions and soothing yourselves, um, being more assertive with time and multitasking, so on and so forth. So we've got to take stock on where your kids are because if they haven't been around in other kids, they weren't mixing it up. They weren't in conflict with one another and figuring how to manage things and either move on from some friend or repair relationships, all kinds of things. They don't know how to talk to teachers necessarily the way that if they get a test score they don't like, they come home crying rather than go to the teacher and saying, hey, I thought I had this right, what's up? So think about the ways and the things your kids haven't been doing in the past year, if, especially if they've been at home, and then what again to do is see if you could partner with other parents this month before, after, before Labor Day is here to do just some things together. Parents that you trust that have families who are observing masking and things like that and get together and just start mixing it up. Having the kids playing games together because there's winning and losing. There's someone who you know knows a game better than another. Having older kids teach things to younger kids. There are different ways to help them along with milestones. And a big thing is check how much are you doing for your child that another child of that age should be doing for themselves. This is, remember, we, we give our three-year-olds and four-year-olds, you want the red dress or the blue dress? It's helping them make decisions. Are you picking and laying out the clothes for your 10-year-old? Let's move back and see what can you start really handing over to them because that will move them along with milestones and build their confidence. I think that's terrific. Um, another question that came up, which I think many students may be in this boat is, what about kids who are starting new schools? Kids who are maybe relocated or have moved from elementary to middle school or middle school to high school, or maybe in a whole new area relocated because of COVID or just in general, what advice would you all have for supporting those kids and supporting families in, in, in preparing their kids? That's a great question. And we actually got this a lot, even last year when people were like graduating out of a school and never going back now having to go to a new school during quarantine. Um, I would say similar to some things that have been mentioned before, see what you can learn about the school online, see who you can contact. Can you go visit? Can you walk around the neighborhood? Do you have access um, some like on Facebook and some other spaces? There's sometimes like neighborhood groups. Can you tap into there and say, hey, any moms with a child at such and such school? Do you want to meet up? Like, or maybe if you can't meet, you're not comfortable in person, can we get our kids on like a virtual Zoom or find something fun to do? Any connections that you can make to the place and the people will help in that transition because it's not gonna be brand new. Um, can you contact, you know, do you know anyone who went to the school? Maybe someone who's there or graduated from there can say, hey, this was my experience. Like any 
any creative moms are creative dads are creative you know family members can be really creative when we care about our kids and so i would encourage you to tap into like anything you can do to find out about the place its surroundings or the people even like if you can't meet someone who's there does the website have videos of things that happen at the school does the website does the school have a social media account where you can see some of the experiences that young people will have like now, I mean, huge benefit of the experience that we've had is that so many people are more active virtually and schools are more active virtually as well. And so I think we can access a lot more about a school now online than, than we could have before. And I would Elizabeth, say, I just, I'm connect, sorry, Anne Marie. Oh, no, I would say I would connect your kids if you can to a club, a club or sports, something where they're going to be around other peers and they'll get to know them. And look, if you saw my TED talk, it's like school anxiety. We moved from Staten Island to Fort Lauderdale just as I started high school. And I talk about be patient and help your, your child be patient with the fact that it takes a little time to settle in. But the sooner they can like connect with a club or something of something of interest, the, the more likely they'll meet people and they'll start to feel more comfortable. Sorry, Jane. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say to um, be more assertive, just to, to make sure if don't ask the school <laughs> if you can bring your child in. I mean, that is really key to bring the kid to meet the teacher if they want to meet the principal. And they can even go on multiple days. You know, the school can accommodate them. So I would be kind and courteous, but really say that, you know, my kid really needs this and get them in the school building as many days as you need. <laughs> I think those are all great pieces of advice. And I will just echo some of the things we talked about before, which would be um, that modeling of, you know, can you share times when you've been in similar situations? Uh, you know, Anne Marie's new school experience, I do the same thing. I moved before seventh grade and remember not getting out of the car. And, you know, I was, I was convinced I wasn't getting out of that car the whole year. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, I was, you know, I, I share that with a lot of uh, folks who I see, but also, um, you know, the, the exposure piece, like be, be having some exposure to make the unfamiliar more familiar right now. And then finally, you know, hearing your kids when they're saying they're anxious and, and instead of just like minimizing it, validating it, hearing it, but then also uh, combining that with, you know, and, I, and I'm confident and I know you can do it. Anthony and Anne Marie, can I ask you a question for the parents? Yeah. Um, if the kids are having severe anxiety and you think that, you know, this is a time to bring them to a mental health professional, what kind of professional should they be looking for? And how do they know that they are working with the right person? Oh, what a great question. What a great question. <laughs> Uh, Tony? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we didn't plan that one. <laughs> no, I, we didn't. I mean, I mean, I would just say we have evidence based treatments for anxiety. We know that cognitive behavioral therapy is our gold standard behavioral treatment for anxiety. So I would start there. Um, the link that I sent to effectivechildtherapy.org actually gives a lot of fact sheets to what to look for particular problems. Oh, and mm -hmm what are the types of very specific types of interventions that are helpful for those concerns? There are also um, parent videos, I think within Effective Child Therapy's website for, so, you know, they're brief videos for parents to help you think about what questions to ask a therapist, how to evaluate whether this is the therapy for my child. Um, but yes, cognitive behavior therapy is the way to go for school avoidance. And fit matters. At this, you know, so the science is important, but I think it's also important that you trust and, and feel a connection and that your kid feels a connection to whoever they're meeting with. Um, and I would go with your gut. If you have a phone call or initial conversation, trust your gut on whether it feels like a good fit. Um, I'm certainly not, you know, I know I'm not a fit for everybody. I know that, you know, that there's amazing clinicians who I know are not a fit for everybody, even if they're terrific at their jobs. So I trust your spidey sense with that and you know, use the science as that foundation. The other thing we have to say too, and, and to know is the research that we did, and we did the largest clinical trial sponsored by the National Institutes for Mental Health for Anxiety in Children. I was one of the principal investigators. Tony was on it as a, an evaluator and a therapist. And what we found in 488 kids is that the combination of cognitive behavior therapy and medication was most effective 
for 80% of the kids who had combination treatment, but cognitive behavior therapy alone and certain medication, this SSRIs they're called alone, are also equally effective. The choice of what to use and when, um, you have to think about how much school is your child missing or how severe is their distress and upset because the, that makes a difference. You might want to go to medication if CBT alone or other therapies alone haven't worked. If they're really falling behind and missing school, that may be the way to go. And so you want an informed child psychiatrist who works closely with a cognitive behavior therapist. But then we often in the American Academy of Child Psychiatry recommends for mild to moderate cases, and the clinician would help determine that, Start with CBT because it's goal directed. You're going to be evaluating in your child is, are we making progress? And if you're not because of the nature of the anxiety and that child, then they bring on medication. Um, so just know there are options, but you do have to dig around to find people who you know CBT well, and also, you know, you want to go to child psychiatry for this. Thank you. Um, and I know we're a little after seven o'clock. Um, I'm sorry we weren't able to, you know, answer every single question, but I think we touched on the, the main topics. And please do, uh, you, you know, check out the resources. I put them all in the chat. We will continue to add on our COPE Columbia site additional resources, and we'll be continuing to create content and provide content. Um, and so please do use those resources. I want to thank Elizabeth, Anne-Marie, and Jane for all their insights today and, and experiences and, and recommendations. I think it's so valuable for you know, all of us as caregivers getting ready for this school year. So thank you all. And thank, thank you. the teachers out there, everyone, because yes. they're there for your kids. So thank you guys <laughs> for being with us today. Absolutely. And thank you everybody for attending. Um, have a wonderful rest of the summer and enjoy. <laughs> Best of luck with the Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye bye.